Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rob Willis, and I'm today's uh, meeting moderator. Um, welcome to the Lead and Copper Rule Revision Community Roundtable from Alden. Um, two very quick notes um, before I turn it over to Eric and Yu Ting. Uh, the first is I ask that you keep your lines on mute uh, so that we don't um, uh, cause any noise disruptions. And the second, um, just want everyone to know that the video, uh, the Zoom meeting is being live streamed. Um, so I want everyone just to recognize that. So I'd like to immediately turn it over to Yu Ting. Yu Ting. Thank you, Rob. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you. My name is Yuting Galeran. I am the Deputy Office Director in the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water in the Office of Water in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, as folks know, uh, we shorthand our office OGWDW, Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water. We implement the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, which requires EPA to establish and enforce standards that public water drinking water system must follow. Um, Along with the developing standards, our office also um, are involved in rule implementation, uh, which includes developing guidance, working with our regional offices um, to work with states, which often are the primacy agency. And we also support drinking water system through technical assistance um, to make sure that they have the technical managerial financial support that they have. Uh, we also have a component that provide funding through our grants program. Um, for instance, more recently, we have the um, implementation of water infrastructure improvements for the nation's Act win, uh, which included lead reduction drinking water and also lead testing in schools. Um, another component that's related funding is a state revolving fund program um, that we implement. And we also collaborate with other federal partners as well on topics such as lead and other um, important topics such as workforce. So it's good to see everyone this morning. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Eric. Thanks, Yu Tang. Uh, my name is Eric Bernison, and I direct the Standards and Risk Management Division in the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water, the same office that Yu Tang is the uh, deputy director for. Um, our division within the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water oversees uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act processes for identifying contaminants of concern, um, uh, making determinations to regulate and reviewing regulations on a regular basis and promulgating those regulations. We'll, uh, we're, we're, I'm particularly um, happy to be here today to hear Malden's perspectives on the lead and copper rule, which is a regulation that we have been working for many years to improve the public health protections for. Um, I'm going to be uh, particularly keen on hearing things, uh, uh, hearing items and, and concerns from the community today uh, about ways that we can improve the lead and copper rule revisions as, uh, as, our, our, um, as our team considers um, uh, with the agency whether or not to uh, do additional revisions to lead and copper rule. We'll be working on those actions. So I'm really enthused to, to be here today and hear your perspectives. Thank you, Eric. Um, uh, thank you, Mareo Fernandez y Mora from Clean Water Action for working with EPA to organize this important discussion with Malden, Massachusetts. Uh, we're conducting these roundtables to hear directly from you about the lead and copper rule revision related issues that are most important to you and how lead has impacted your community. So welcome, as what Eric said, to all the community members here today, including representatives from community groups, utilities, local government, uh, citizens, and all members of the public viewing by, uh, via live stream. And also thank you, Representative Clark, for providing remarks for today's roundtable. Um, EPA recognizes a range of community experiences regarding lead and drinking water. And we look forward to hearing your thoughts and perspective on this critical uh, important issue. Your input will help us, um, EPA, as we review the lead and copper rule revision and really work to ensure that we are doing our best to protect public health, especially, especially for those that are most at risk and impacted by lead and drinking water. Uh, we hope that you have been able to watch our LCRR 101 video as it provides the context about the regulation the agency is reviewing. So before I turn back to Rob, thank you again for taking the time to be here today. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and perspective 
about how EPA can ensure the lead and copper rule revisions protect communities like yours. You and Eric, thank you. Um, and so I'd like to provide a little space for Moreo as the community uh, organizer lead here for opening remarks. And then uh, we're gonna go uh, to record of remarks from US Representative Clark. Uh, Moreo. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mario Fernandez Imora. I'm the Associate State Director of Clean Water Massachusetts. And I wanna thank everyone so much for taking the time to be here. I've had the pleasure of working with Malden on this issue uh, since 2019. And it has been a real pleasure to see uh, the group of folks grow and connect more on how we can really address this issue as quickly and equitably as possible. Uh, the group of people we have here today represent a number of different perspectives from the city itself to dedicated community residents and organizers who have a number of concerns related to lead and drinking water. And I'm really excited to have this conversation and see what comes out of it. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, okay, um, so I should be able to uh, see my screen. Um, uh, folks able to see that? Um, you should just see a, a black background right now that says lead MP4 at the top. I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, play the video. These are recorded remarks from U.S. Representative Clark. Good morning, everyone. I'm honored to be speaking with you today about the urgent need to provide clean, lead-free water to our communities. I wanna start by thanking Clean Water Action Massachusetts for nominating Malden to be a part of this roundtable. Your leadership in this fight is essential to build a safe, clean environment for all families and for future generations. Thank you to all the local experts, activists, and residents who are participating today to share their personal stories and stand up for their neighborhoods. And thank you to the EPA for hosting today's discussion. It's so critical that the people affected by EPA policies have a say in the process of writing them. And I'm grateful that Malden has been included in the conversation. The reason it's so important that we be part of the dialogue about the new lead and copper rule is because the issue hits so close to home. Malden has been found to have the highest percentage of lead water pipes in our state. Today, Malden has approximately 3,000 lead water pipes out of 12,000 delivering water to homes and businesses. The city is developing a replacement program to remove these pipes in public streets and is working with property owners to replace them on private property. But accomplishing this vital goal requires leadership and partnership from the federal government. In 1991, EPA published a regulation to control lead and copper in drinking water. The lead and copper rule has been revised several times in the decades since. And we have the opportunity today to propose further changes to make our water safer for everyone. Among the necessary improvements EPA has already suggested are the use of science-based testing protocols to find more sources of lead in drinking water, establishing a trigger level to jumpstart mitigation earlier and in more places, more complete lead service line replacements, requiring water systems to identify and make public the locations of lead service lines for the first time requiring testing in schools and childcare facilities. This final improvement is central to my work in Washington and in the fifth district to make our entire Commonwealth stronger and improve the health of the nation's families. Nowhere is this more important than in schools and childcare facilities. These buildings should be the safest place for kids, but a 2019 study from the Harvard School of Public Health found that 44% of schools tested had more water samples with the lead concentration at or above the state's level. 
That's why I'm fighting to pass the American Jobs Plan. The proposal includes calls to replace 100% of the nation's lead and pipe service lines, reduce lead exposure in 400,000 schools and child care facilities, modernize our public schools, invest $100 billion to upgrade and build new public schools through $50 billion in direct grants, an additional $50 billion leveraged through bonds, including funds to improve indoor air quality and ventilation. The danger of lead poisoning is especially serious for babies and young children. Even low levels of exposure have been linked to damage to the central and peripheral nervous system. Learning disabilities, shorter stature, impaired hearing, and impaired formation and function of blood cells. Like so many issues facing our country, the impacts of pollution, contaminated infrastructure, and drinking water are felt most by communities of color and low-income families who endure disproportionate exposure to toxins. For decades, discriminatory policies and practices have unequally burdened minority neighborhoods, harming their health and perpetuating a cycle of poverty. The long-standing inequity in our approach to environmental regulation is the root cause of environmental racism and must be addressed. House Democrats and the Biden administration recognize this, and it's why we put equity at the heart of everything we do. The fight for clean water is a key tenet of climate justice, and I'm committed to keeping racial equity at the center of my fight here and in Washington. I'm eager to hear what concerns and questions you have and to hear your suggestions for the lead and copper rule. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Again, uh, my name is Rob Willis, and as today's meeting moderator, my job and that of the other support staff is to make sure that this meeting runs as smoothly as possible. Just as a reminder, um, this meeting is being live streamed and as a result is also being recorded. Um, before we jump into it, I want to recognize that many of us are still working from locations that increase the likelihood of interruptions, whether it's from other family members or pets, neighbors, unreliable internet or whatever it is. It's okay. We've all been there. Um, I want to spend the next three minutes going over some really important information about the meeting. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, expectations for participation. Um, I want to talk to you about some ground rules. I want to talk to you very quickly about the Zoom interface um, and then do a quick agenda review. And I hope to do that in uh, under three minutes. So I'm going to uh, share my screen here um, with a set of ground rules. And uh, folks could let me know if uh, and when you're able to see that. Folks able to see that PowerPoint deck? Not yet. Not yet, okay. How about now? No. Nope. There we go. There we go. Uh, thank you. Um, as my colleagues know, my um, PowerPoint was acting up this morning. Um, okay, so participation, participation expectations and ground rules. So the first one is just keep your lines muted when not speaking. Um, the second is that video on is preferred, especially if speaking. Um, the third is that we're gonna be using the Zoom raise your hand function um, so that I know who wants to jump into the conversation. Um, and the way that you raise your virtual hand is by press, pressing Alt-Y. So if folks wanna just try uh, putting their hands up and down, press, pressing Alt-Y, that would be great. So I'm, so I'm gonna be asking folks to um, raise your hands as part of doing that, great. And Alt-Y raises your hand and Alt-Y lowers your hand. Um, and then I will be calling on folks to participate by name. Um, the third, uh, the fourth one here is, um, I'm gonna ask that you strive to make your voice heard um, at least twice during the meeting. So please don't uh, hesitate to speak up. Um, the uh, Fifth one there is uh, we have a couple of exercises where we're using the chat function. Um, and so I'm gonna be encouraging folks to participate in all three of those exercise exercises. And then the last one um, is uh, 
uh, since we've got uh, an hour and a half uh, dedicated to conversation, um, that we just mind the time um, so that we ensure that uh, everybody has a chance to speak. Um, I want to spend uh, just one second here just talking a little bit about the Zoom interface uh, for folks that are unfamiliar with it. Um, you can usually get the bar uh, that's got all of the controls to show up um, by just moving your mouse and that should um, activate uh, the screen. Um, on the bottom left-hand corner is the mute unmute button. So when there's a red slash through that old time microphone, it means that you're unmuted. And when there's no red slash through it, it means that your mic is active. Um, the same goes for the uh, video. Um, the video camera has um, a red slash through it when it is not uh, uh, broadcasting your video. Um, the participant tab um, lets you see who is on the call. Um, if you don't wanna use the Alt-Y to raise your hand, um, if you press the participant tab, you should have an additional uh, option to raise and lower your hand. And then the, the, the chat bubble, um, that opens up a, a chat dialog box um, and it allows uh, chat. I have set up the chat to allow you to chat directly to uh, us as hosts um, or to send a message to everybody, um, but I have disabled the ability for you all to chat directly. Um, as I'm trying to minimize uh, the number of parallel dialogues that are going on. Um, so uh, we've got uh, four main blocks of time together. The first is a community presentation um, where Moreo and uh, Steve um, uh, Estes are gonna be uh, uh, giving a formal presentation. And then we have three blocks of discussion time. Um, we've got a block on identifying lead in drinking water, on addressing lead in drinking water, uh, and communications and public outreach. And for every 30 minute block, um, uh, I'm gonna be asking folks uh, to participate verbally. Um, and then at the end of the session, um, if there are things that, uh, that you want to make sure um, EPA hears about that topic, I'm gonna provide some space uh, for you to put that uh, into chat. Um, and so we're gonna run through uh, that exercise um, at every 30 minute block. So without further ado, what I'd like to do um, is um, I'm gonna ask my colleague Angela to uh, bring up the presentation and then Moreo, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you again. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, this presentation was created both by Clean Water Action Massachusetts as well as the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. Um, so thank you to all of our participants. Um, I wanna recognize that there were some last minute additions who didn't make it onto the slide. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, really happy with the mix of people we have. Dealing with lead and drinking water requires uh, participation from a number of different stakeholders. And I think that we've done a good job of gathering those stakeholders together today. I want to especially thank uh, Councillor at Large Stephen Winslow, as well as Councillor at Large Craig Spadafora for joining us today um, and representing the, um, the work that City Council has done on this issue. Thank you to Maria Louise, Special Assistant to the Mayor, who has been um, my early and often partner on this. Uh, could not do the work that we've been doing without her. Thank you to Yem Lip and John DeSantis, who are going to be able to speak to um, what Malden has been doing in terms of sampling, inventory, and replacement. Uh, thank you to Eric Worrell from ASDEP and Stephen Estes Margiasi, uh, Director of Planning and Sustainability from the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority. And thank you so, so much to our community residents and organizers who have taken the time to be here uh, for two hours during a work day. We so appreciate you. Uh, Susie Margot Ecker from Malden Corps, um, as well as Erga Pieretti. Marsha Manong, um, and Malden Corps stands for Communities Organizing for Racial Equity. Uh, Marsha Manong, a local resident and organizer. Karen Colon Hayes, also a local resident and organizer. Um, and welcome to Karen Lynch and I think a few other folks from the executive board of the Malden chapter of Mass Senior Action. Uh, we know that you are very active in the local community and that your support and attention on this issue really branches out um, to affect other residents' awareness of this issue. And we're very grateful for you taking the time. We can move to the next slide. 
So our goals today are really to map out the Malden of narrative and hopefully provide an example of water systems like Malden to the EPA and identify points of intersection with upcoming changes to the lead and copper rule. Um, we really wanna point out what the lead and copper rule ends up looking like on the ground, including ways that it's been successful and ways that it needs to be improved. And we wanna share our own successes and difficulties within the community. Um, a lot of creative effort has been put towards guaranteeing equitable lead service line replacement. And that's a challenge, we have a long way to go. And hopefully when we uh, share out those challenges and successes, it will give EPA a better idea of how the rule can be improved to help community meet those challenges. Uh, we want to identify points of agreement and disagreement. We are a diverse group of stakeholders, so we have a diverse set of opinions um, and ways that we approach this issue. And that's actually better. Uh, by identifying points of agreement, it shows um, common uh, common easy points that EPA can take into account and by identifying points of disagreement, hopefully we can identify the barriers um, that are preventing agreement on those issues, which often comes down to lack of resources, lack of capacity. Um, and even though this is a regulatory rule, obviously um, in order for a rule to be successful, it requires a lot of or, um, coordination from a variety of different agencies to guarantee that the resources are in place to actually make that rule um, possible for communities to comply with. And then of course, we do wanna provide feedback to the EPA on the lead and copper rule. And um, like I said, hopefully take some of our real life experiences and translate them into how a lead and copper rule revision could really make those experiences better. And we can move on to the next slide. So a little bit about us. Um, like I said, one of my main goals is really uh, communicating what a water system like Malden looks like on the ground. Um, we are not a very large water system, although uh, Malden does serve a number of residents. And uh, that's reflected in this conversation. Some of these partnerships are new. We're just finding ways to connect with each other. And uh, most of the folks on this call, aside from the city, are here in a volunteer capacity. And so, we did not reach any pre-consensus before this meeting. Um, like I said, approaching this from a variety of positions and responsibilities, but I actually hope that that's helpful to the EPA because I know that there are a number of water systems that are in that same position where there isn't a bunch of capacity for formal partnerships. There aren't a lot of resources um, to guarantee the community outreach portion. And hopefully that will actually provide a really good roadmap for EPA for what is necessary for rules like this to be successful. Um, and even though we're not all going to agree on recommendations for the lead and copper rule or how exactly to solve this problem on the ground, one thing that makes me love working with Malden is that everyone really approaches this as us against the problem. Even when we disagree, it's not us versus each other. We recognize that there are a number of systemic barriers and inequalities in place um, that make this issue really difficult to solve because ultimately, uh, no one wants lead in their drinking water. We want to get it out as quickly as possible. And we're here to figure out how to do that. And we can move on to the next slide. So a little bit about Malden, a population of about 60,000 uh, approximately. I think that number needs to be updated, but um, last that was on the website was 3,200, closer to 3,000 now lead service lines. That's about a quarter of the water service lines delivering drinking water to Malden residents. So obviously this is a significant problem. And as we all know, lead service line inventories, unfortunately are not complete and accurate yet. Hopefully the lead and copper rule will help change that. So this is an approximation. Uh, since 2006, there have been elevated lead levels in drinking water and that's led to two consent decrees being issued from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. And the city is currently uh, required and successfully meeting the requirement to replace at least 150 lead service lines per year until 2027, although they're actually doing a little bit better than that. Um, and I'll let Malden brag about that. 49% uh, of all Malden households qualify for federal and state affordable housing, which means that 49% of the population fall into extremely low, very low, and the low income category. We know that low income folks struggle the most when expected to finance private side replacement. Uh, in addition to that, a number of Malden residents are renters, people of color, and speak languages other than English, um, and some of those households don't speak English at all. I'll talk about 
I'll talk about this more throughout our conversation, but obviously we know that uh, low-income communities, communities of color, language isolated communities are often the most disproportionately impacted by lead and drinking water. And therefore when we require private side replacement from those same communities, we can um, expect persisting inequities to occur in terms of who is able to afford their lead service line replacement um, and how quickly. And we can move forward. Great, so uh, some challenges that I've already started talking about, high rent or low income population. It is not surprising that that is translated into a low participation rate in terms of private side lead service line replacement initiatives. Due to a currently strapped budget, Malden is not able to cover the cost of public and private side replacements, meaning that the private side replacement is the responsibility of the property owner. Uh, leads to inequity in terms of renters and low income home ownership. Um, and also uh, communication and public outreach is a challenge in and of itself so that even those who might have the resources to replace the line are not always uh, convinced to do so. And obviously in terms of outreach, reaching the most vulnerable populations is difficult. Language isolation requires additional staff capacity and resources to translate outreach materials into the appropriate languages. And a number of renters don't actually receive their water bills, meaning that there's um, a, that limits the, the traditional channels of communication when it comes to communicating lead and drinking water. And of course, uh, Malden is busy, staff time is limited, which means that a lot of the solutions that we know are ultimately successful for guaranteeing faster and more equitable replacement are currently slightly out of reach. And we can move forward. Um, but despite all of the challenges, there are a number of creative solutions that have been and are being pursued. Um, one is the Malden Ordinance that I hope Malden brags about more because it is really um, innovative and it has led to a number of lead service line replacements. Uh, this ordinance requires the property ownership um, when being transferred at point of sale requires a lead service line replacement or a plan to replace that line. Uh, these, the next two are pending implementation, but they are a part of the ordinance. So when applying for a building permit with a project value of over 30,000, someone would also have to replace their lead service line along with uh, the transfer of a tenant in an owner non-occupied multifamily property. Um, both of, all of these are really great initiatives. It provides a little bit more motivation and uh, requirement to finance private side replacement on the part of the property owner. Um, and it's a really great example, I think, for other communities that are looking to, um, to increase private side participation. We're in the process of deepening community partnerships. That's all of the awesome people we have um, on the line today. Uh, when there is limited staff capacity, leaning on established community groups that have the trust and pulse of their local community and already have open and trusting lines of communication, can make a huge difference when it comes to communicating risks of lead and drinking water, as well as galvanizing people together to achieve solutions. And of course, um, like most things in life, a lot of this comes down to money. And so we want to particularly shout out and thank Representative Clark of District 5 of Massachusetts for um, submitting a $4 million community project funding request that would enable the city to prioritize private side replacement um, on behalf of those who can't afford it. And we've got our fingers crossed and are always looking for more state and federal resources when it comes to um, allowing communities to fund, um, fund both public and private side replacement. And we can move forward. Um, so what's missing? Uh, grants, grants are missing the money. Like I've been saying, technical assistance is also really important and improved communication of various state and federal grant and loan opportunities. Sometimes it's the case that the money isn't there and additional funding pools need to be created, but sometimes it's the case that the money is there and that uh, notification of these programs aren't reaching cities um, as quickly and efficiently as possible. Cities aren't always aware of deadlines. And of course, even if there is awareness, if there's not the staff capacity to match, um, those loans and grant programs don't end up being utilized often by the communities who need them most, who are facing the most limited staff capacity and most limited resources. Um, and then finally, additional partnerships that invest educationally and financially in local community residents can make a huge difference. 
Ideally, when we approach issues like this, it's not just about providing resources to the community for lead service line replacement. It's also creating uh, self-sustaining local employment in the form of public outreach and training additional folks um, so that they can serve as probably more effective public health messengers than I can because of that local leadership and that local um, connection. And we can move forward. So a couple of themes, you'll see that there's a disconnect um, in clean water's opinion between what is health protective versus what is in compliance. Um, there is no safe level of lead in drinking water. And I say that a lot. So ultimately the goal is to remove all sources of lead so that people aren't experiencing exposure at any levels. Um, how do we reach those vulnerable groups that I've been talking about is a huge question that we need to turn our attention towards. How do we utilize community partnership more effectively to improve outreach? And then finally, um, how do we at the local level address challenges in conveying the seriousness of this issue to residents and pushing past objections? For instance, uh, the cost of private side replacement, as well as um, nuisances like road repair that make some residents uh, hesitant to support lead service line replacement or even get a little bit grumpy when lead service line replacement occurs and we can move forward. So these are clean water actions led in copper rule recommendations. And obviously, um, like I said, these are not the recommendations of everyone on this call. We all come from a diverse set of perspectives, but this is what clean water thinks. Uh, EPA should take it a step further by requiring um, all, re all regulated water systems to ultimately replace their lead service lines. At this point, um, we know and it has been well established that there is no safe level of lead in drinking water, therefore no sources of lead in drinking water should ultimately exist. Um, one of the things that the EPA did not end up including in its analysis um, was that even low lead level exposure causes cardiovascular disease complications that would likely um, yield, if they weren't there, a benefit of over $200 billion in health benefits from cardiovascular disease reduction alone if um, lead service line replacement, um, if all lead service lines in the country were replaced. Uh, next, EPA should require water systems to cover the cost of replacement regardless of ownership or whether the line is located under private or public property. This is contentious, but at this point, we have a number of case studies that show that when communities um, finance public and private side replacement, lead service lines are replaced faster, and those who can't afford that private side replacement um, aren't left behind. Obviously, that is not um, a currently reachable reality for every community to finance that, which is why we do need additional funding to make sure that that's not out of reach for any community, because again, it is often the communities who have the highest number of residents who are not able to replace their lead service lines that also have the lowest budgets in, able to, um, in order to help those residents replace those lines. EPA should do more to prevent partial replacements. Um, we support the aspects of the lead and copper rule that requires water systems to take risk mitigation steps when partial replacements occur, but we think the EPA should do even more to limit this practice. We know that private side replacements do not ultimately reliably reduce lead at the tap and may in fact increase lead at the tap. Um, so we really think the EPA should prohibit partial lead service line replacement, drain routine maintenance um, with provisions for temporary waivers for special circumstances where a customer has refused to work with the water system or to grant access to the property. Um, and finally, EPA should not reduce the rate of lead service line replacement. A number of really excellent changes were made to this rule that will close loopholes that have resulted in very few full lead service line replacements, but reducing the annual percentage um, from 7% to 3% really doesn't follow the spirit of the rest of the improvements of the rule, which are ultimately to get these lines out of the ground as quickly as possible and as equitably as possible. And so we think that by reducing that ultimate percentage that works against that final goal of getting lead out of drinking water as quickly as possible. Um, and we can move on. And I'll kick it off to Steve, thank you so much. And this is Rob from us, uh, Steve, before you go, um, so right after Steve's presentation here, um, we're going to move uh, directly to uh, community comments. 
Um, and so um, the first topic that we have um, that we're gonna be talking about is identifying lead in drinking water. And we're gonna use Steve's presentation to uh, lead us right into that uh, conversation. And so I'm asking folks, um, as you listen uh, to Steve's presentation, uh, begin thinking about, you know, and, and write down what are the two or three most important things you want um, to hear to have EPA hear about identifying lead in drinking water so that once uh, Steve's presentation is done, um, I'm gonna immediately open it up uh, for uh, a community conversation. And I'm gonna do that again by asking you to hit Alt-Y to raise your hand. So Steve, if you could uh, uh, keep the presentation to seven or eight minutes, that would be great. And then I'm gonna move immediately to the community. Sounds great. So thank you. I'm Steve Esty Smarjowski. I'm Director of Planning and Sustainability at the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority. We're the regional wholesaler that supplies uh, 51 communities in the metropolitan Boston area, including the city of Malton. So we're the front end um, of the water supply for Malton. It's great to be here with our partners at Clean Water Action and communities uh, we find have found um, and continue to find as it relates to the lead and copper rule and the challenges that having good partners means that things move forward well. First slide, please. So as public water suppliers, we, we are really folks who are protecting public health. Um, that's our goal, that's where our history comes from. And I'd like to sort of say, even though lead levels in children's blood have declined 90%, it's great to see that improvement. Even though lead levels at our customer taps have declined dramatically, you can see these, uh, some of our local results here, there's still more to be done. We'd like both of those lines to be as close to the bottom of those charts as is possible. Um, it's important to recognize as we think about regulatory issues and as we think about implementation um, with the partnerships we've been talking about, that no one can do this alone. This is a shared responsibility between the community, its water supply system, property owners, uh, residents, health officials. We can't manage this problem if we're trying to each do it on our own. And I always want to end this conversation here with the long-term goals. We want to reduce the ability of water and lead to interact, reduce that lead corrosion, and we want to remove lead from contact with our water. Next slide, please. So uh, almost a little bit of the, uh, I love the water, uh, lead and copper rule 101. I'll do a tiny bit of that as we go through. The lead and copper rule revisions now require that we do uh, mandate that we do what our customers have been asking for for a long time, what they expect us to provide, which is information which allows them to understand the risk of a lead service line at their home if one exists and to understand if they're buying or renting a property, uh, what that risk pro profile looks like. Um, we've provided funds and we continue to provide technical assistance for our communities. I know folks in Walden have availed themselves of some of that um, to provide an inventory. Bottom line in the end is that this is one of the most important things we can do to help our customers um, manage their own risk as part of that partnership between us and the individuals. Um, I do like to say that uh, and here in Massachusetts, we're beginning to try and implement the new rule, uh, jumping ahead. Eric, of uh, actual implementation dates. And the state has been trying out to look at unknowns as they've been thinking about lead service line replacement programs. And we do find that uh, when you add the unknowns in, those portions of the service line where the community can't be sure that it's not made out of lead, that we may double or triple that inventory of services that require some level of action. So uh, the new rule has some uh, changes uh, which have made things more interesting. Next slide, please. The regulatory requirements really do provide a floor. Um, and we've been recommending to our customers that they think more about this inventory than what's in the reg. I don't know that I'm recommending that the reg do this, but we're certainly recommending as best practice that communities inventory all the data they have, not only lead service lines, but lead line steel service lines. If you've got a gooseneck um, on galvanized or otherwise, getting that in your inventory so the customers can see it. If you've just got galvanized, uh, that represents some um, issues for water service. It may not be a health issue, but it could be a water pressure or a leak. And then if it's not lead, what is it exactly? Again, to help our customers understand uh, really what's going on between our pipes and their pipes. Next slide, please. And shout out to Malden. Um, 
Next slide. For the fact that they've already got a service line map up there, it's a good start. It doesn't have everything that uh, the new revisions will require, but if you're a resident in Malden, uh, you can type in your address or scroll around your neighborhood and find out if there's a public side or private side surface line made out of lead to your house. Uh, with the improvements the new rule requires, there'll be more information about uh, what's going on between our pipes and their houses. Next slide, please. Next big change that I think that uh, communities, activists, citizens really do need to get their arms around is that the revised lead and copper rule is more focused on the exposure from the lead surface line um, in several ways. The new rules require, um, unlike the current rule, which says that if you've got lead surface lines, uh, half of your sample sites need to be at lead surface lines. The new rule says all of them now must be from lead surface lines. And it requires that we try and sample water that's in that surface line. Those two changes aren't going to change the actual lead levels, but they're going to change the reported levels. Um, and that's going to create uh, both confusion, uh, perhaps some action, which is good, but we always get confusion before we get action and we get worry, some of it necessary and some of it perhaps not related to their specific circumstances. More systems um, we anticipate based on the data we've seen will be over the action level. And under the new rule, every citizen in that community, whether they're served by a lead service line or not, is going to get a notice within 24 hours telling them that there's uh, higher levels of lead in the water. Um, this is something we'd like EPA to think about, figuring out a way to do this, which provides immediate information for those who need to take action without confusing and raising anxiety among those who have lower level of risk, um, those who don't have the lead service lines. Um, and of course, as we've seen um, with these higher levels, more communities will be pushed into mandatory lead service line replacements, and I'll say more about that in a bit. Uh, one bit of example there uh, from my colleagues in Malden to see uh, from a neighboring community. There's a first liter sample in it that was about seven and a half, uh, but the third, fourth, and fifth samples were all over the action level of 15. So we do anticipate that if we're looking with using the new rule, that we will see more homes that will report higher levels. That lead has always been there, but we're going to be reporting it. Next slide, please. So um, since 1998, MWRA has been providing funding as a way of helping our communities remove obstacles for improving their water systems, improving public health. Uh, we started that dealing first with um, uh, cast iron mains, uh, but very rapidly began to include uh, replacement of lead service lines. After um, all the publicity around Flint, the MWRA began a uh, set out a hundred million dollar zero interest loan program to basically remove or alleviate the obstacle of funding. Uh, those to get that funding, communities just remove all the lead pipe from the main to the home, both the public and private portion. If any portion of that service line is lead or brass or galvanized, the entire service line is required for replacement. We've done this because we think that every community should be replacing their lead service lines regardless of their 90th percentile values, because we know that the lead service line does present a risk and it should be removed. Um, there's no good reason for leaving it in the ground if we can get it out of the ground. It would of course be helpful to have more federal funds. Uh, when we provide a zero interest loan, that means that every community is cross subsidizing those communities that still have lead service lines. That's been manageable, but it certainly would make it easier for folks to move faster, and we might be able to offer grants rather than loans if there was more federal money involved. Uh, next slide. Steve, this is Robert. If you could, if you could try to um, wrap up in the next couple of minutes, I want to then move to uh, community comments. Trying to move along, Rob. Thanks. Uh, won't say much about this other than say we've been successful, um, and many communities have been using this funds our funds and local funds to remove lead mines. Next slide, uh, getting to something that was has already been mentioned. It's clear that if we're going to see full lead service line replacement all the way from the main to the house, uh, financing helps. We've seen that in communities where they choose voluntarily to fund uh, the private side, that there's been more ability to get those private sides done, but that's been a local voluntary decision. Um, if there was more funds available, we expect that more communities would be funding that private side. Excuse my lights going off here. We're environmentally conscious. 
So next slide. Say a tiny bit about school and child care sampling. Um, this is a good improvement to the rule uh, that we are requiring the information to schools and child care facilities about lead and health risks. Uh, the offer to sample from the water departments is useful, but it's not necessarily the best way to deal with this. Our experience, we've been providing laboratory services to our cities and towns for the last five years um, at no cost, had a lot of samples done, but the mitigation of those lead levels is more difficult to get done. Data alone doesn't solve the problem. And we have found that particularly the smaller family daycares don't participate. Um, we think that uh, using the licensing programs here in our state, the Department of Early Education and Care would be better suited as a mechanism for not just getting the sampling done in every place, uh, the rule does have a, a logical loophole that if someone doesn't say yes, we can't be required to sample there. But the regulatory agency that licenses those folks could mandate that and could mandate mitigation. So uh, something to be dealt with there. Next slide, please. Um, corrosion control is an important element, um, has been. It's been what's reduced the lead levels in homes uh, throughout the country over the last 30 years. Um, I would say I think that the rule is excessively complex and prescriptive as it deals with this, and we hope that as EPA is reviewing the rule, they find ways to push this element forward without creating uh, more of a bureaucratic morass. This is already the most complicated rule that um, water systems have to manage. And I will say to my customers in Malden, we are thinking about this, and we've actually already begun um, a program to evaluate uh, co revised corrosion control if it's necessary. So last slide. Uh, um, I'd say don't wait, use this time productively, whether you're EPA or your community, um, don't delay. Um, I always worry that we, that we let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, I can think of lots of ways of improving this rule, um, but quite frankly, I'd rather see it implemented. Let's get started. Um, EPA is going to notice, uh, uh, announce tomorrow that they've moved the rule implementation back most of a year from uh, January to October. Um, and we're not going to get the push that we would have had earlier. It's already a little delayed. Let's make sure we keep moving. Communities uh, need to be working on improved inventory and outreach now. Um, mandate from EPA helps us on that. Communities need to be working on discussions about funding options for the private side. Um, having that rule mandate in place helps us. We need to be getting those lead service lines out. Again, the rule mandate makes my job easier in convincing communities to do this. And to end, our goal is zero lead um, in the water. We'd like to be moving towards that. And no lead in contact with the water. We'd like to be moving towards that. Let's move and move as quickly as we can. And thank you, Rob. Sorry I ran a little long. No problem. Thank you, Steve, very much. Um, so I'd like to uh, immediately move to um, uh, community comments here, and uh, folks should be seeing my screen now um, that has a description of um, the uh, topic area that we're interested in um, getting comments here. So um, Steve gave a wonderful intro to the identifying lead and drinking water theme. And so now I'm asking folks to go ahead and use Alt-Y um, to raise your hand, and then I will call on you, and you can uh, jump in uh, to the conversation. And so I'm asking you to share um, thoughts uh, on identifying lead and drinking water. So please raise your hand, um, hitting Alt-Y, and I will call on you. Um, Erka, please. Excellent presentation. I just wanted to amplify the fact that I don't think that there should be any tolerance or um, um, allowing there to be partial lead um, replacements because it's not good any way you flip it. So that's the only recommendation that I would really feel strongly about making. And also the importance of the language access for these testing and the information, because again, we don't know what we don't know. And if we don't understand the information, then it doesn't really mean much if we're gonna move forward. But I think awareness of the family members is really, really important and to really try to mitigate the lack of um, language access to this important information and the sense of urgency. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next in line, I've got uh, uh, Karen and then Stephen Winslow. So Karen, please jump in. 
Hi, um, good morning, everybody. And thank you for that presentation. Um, it was really well done. Um, I actually I put it in the chat as well, but um, Erga touched on some of this that we need to, you know, really be a, a be able to get out to the public about the social determinants of health, right? How this really affects um, um, people and families and their health and where they live in Malden um, could, you know, be either a positive thing or a negative thing de depending on their lead pipe, um, you know, what that causes and how much lead is getting into their um, drinking water. I'm not sure if the public ha um, has a true understanding of, you know, what that really means and the inequities of it all. And I really want to push for like making sure that we reach out, which is why we're here, the public um, and our community advocates here that we help get the word out, but um, also not relying on all um, of our volunteer groups. Um, that's a, a heavy load on everybody. And, you know, maybe offering some type of um, stipend to those groups um, to help them um, move along because the same groups are, on a lot of these calls. <laughs> so I think that would be really helpful um, if we're utilizing their time to you know, um, help give them something to uh, continue and, and help them as well, a win-win relationship. Great, Karen, thank you. Um, Stephen Winslow, please. Yeah, Councilor Winslow here. Yeah, um, I know <clears throat> my perspective, it comes from someone who's been involved in the environmental field a long time. I first, uh, job out of Cal Berkeley was to work with the California Air Resources Board and the US EPA to get the lead out of gasoline. That was under the first Jerry Brown and Ronald Reagan. So it's been a while. And uh, uh, since then, I, I came out to Massachusetts to work for the Mass DEP, focused a lot on cl contaminated cleanup in brownfield. So I've worked with the uh, region one out here as well. Um, one of the things from that lens um, is looking at not just uh, lead service lines, but looking at how many people are at the end of the service line. So I know in the hazardous waste world, we always look at exposures and risk and that type of thing. We have um, actually I've worked with uh, uh, someone uh, who's over at MIT. We took our lead service inventory and we overlaid that with the data we have from our schools or where the kids are. So we now have a, a overlay of where um, we think the highest risk are from our lead service lines, but uh, you know, we haven't made progress on that. But in terms of testing, maybe that's something to prioritize to, to test those areas. I think another subtlety in a community like Malden, we have a very different mix of housing. Um, you know, we have everything from single family homes to traditional two and three decker homes, um, you know, New England style, and then we have multifamily housing. And my understanding is, is that the lead service, the service lines of each of those type of housings have sort of different risks. So that may be something that, you know, uh, you know, a two or three family uh, service might have more risk because there's more people there and um, has an older service line than actually a multifamily building. So, um, so some subtlety in terms of maybe prioritizing more uh, testing in the locations where there's more people in lead line service lines that are higher risk. So that'd be one comment just related to testing. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Winslow. Um, next is uh, Marsha. Marsha, please. Thank you. Um, I just want to support what has been said, uh, both by Erga, uh, Karen, and Steve. But I also want to say um, if uh, protect public water supplies are about protecting public health, then um, definitely um, we need to have zero uh, levels of lead in our water. And I think the rule around um, the trigger rule or trigger levels or whatever it is, um, and the, need, the change to the lead copper rule where you have to give uh, 24 hours notice to customers. Um, I would support that, but I would also say, then what? <laughs> you know, what happens after you notify somebody, you call me and tell me um, you've tested my, uh, and there's lead in my, in my water. Um, definitely my anxiety level is going to um, uh, reach a high level. So I, yeah, definitely I want to support as well um, the need for the resources to be there 
and the awareness to our communities? How do we inform our communities so that they can also take action? Because once you've informed me, then I need to take some kind of action. Thank you. Marcia, thank you so much. Um, uh, John, please. Hello, everybody. I'm the uh, superintendent of Malden Water and a licensed primary operator. And um, I've been listening to some of your concerns, especially uh, I see, I understand exactly what you're saying. My biggest tool are there. I'm the boots on the ground guy. I'm the guy that's going to show up to your house to say, okay, this is what the situation is. And this is what our inventory says. And this is why we're doing what we're doing. I usually, I usually send a letter before me and we sit down, we have a, 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 a conversation with the landlord and the tenant as well to let you know what's going on inside and outside. Um, I just wanted to let you know that from my perspective, from being that guy on the ground, visiting households from out of nowhere, all of a sudden you see a dig safe sign in front of your house and you see markings and you wanna know what's going on. Because of Flint and the awareness, uh, so many people are on board to do what they need to do to get the lead out from meter to man. We really do have in Malden, um, a really wise user uh, contingency that really wants to do what needs to be done. On my end of it, I feel what could happen that would be more helpful is more public awareness, you know, maybe more town halls. Uh, what I'm doing within the department is I'm trying to, I'm, I'm joining my time on Wednesday evenings to, to uh, get more licensed operators for distribution to go and take their testing and be able to become operators and licensed officers so they can better answer the public. But I'm finding that um, what really would be helpful is when I do end up on your doorstep, both of us to have an awareness of why we're there and then understand why we're there to help each other. And that public awareness is key when you're talking about the guy who's on the streets. If that helps. Great, um, thank you. Um, next, I've got Craig. Craig? Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. You think I'd understand how to use the mute button by now. <laughs> uh, I agree with what everybody uh, said. Um, so I am a council in the city of Malden, and I happen to uh, have a little bit of a a personal story with with lead, not necessarily in the water, but I had a ski. So I I purchased a, an older home uh, many years ago, and uh, as part of that that um, upgrade, I, I my younger son at the time actually got lead poisoning from the Hossier plaster. Uh, he sucked his thumb, so we were always constant. We caught it. He's fine, uh, but we were always uh, certainly constant. My wife, being a nurse, we were always uh, very. Uh, concerned about the water, uh, and we didn't, we couldn't do the, the you know, the full uh, upgrade to the house all at once because of money, and we knew that we we potentially had lead pipes, so that was something that was always in the, in the front of our mind. But I, I, I th what I'm trying to get to the point is, is um, it's more than just the lead pipes because what we were doing is, as we were doing the construction of the house, I actually volunteered to the city of Malden to get my water tested frequently, uh, which I think it went through the MWRA. I'd fill up a bottle every three or four months run it in the first thing in the morning, I would provide it and, and uh, everything was fine for probably five years. Um, I got a scare probably when my son was six years old, that there was lead in the line. And my house was basically at that point, almost 100% new piping. Uh, what I found out quickly was the city of Mall, this is before the ordinance was enacted, the city of Mall did not, did not have, like many cities, good records. So we didn't know if we had a lead line, they assumed we had a lead line. I paid a vendor to come in and change that line only to find out it was actually changed before I purchased the home. So I think the first thing is logistics. We, we, we are now tracking those pipes, but there's probably a lot of homes in the city that we, we think are lead, maybe lead, may, maybe we think it's copper. We didn't have a way to track that. So inventory for us is key. And I know we're getting better at that. Finally, the other thing is I don't think people realize some of the older faucets and connections in your house contain lead solder. Uh, so that scare we found out was actually an older faucet that we had in the home. It wasn't the, the water supply. It wasn't the water. It was actually an older faucet that had lead in there. 
So I think as we tell people, like Mr. DeSantis said, it certainly is education. It's just not, I think, the main culprits. It's not just main, the, the, the water in the pipe. It's not the, the main service. It might not be the private side. It could be something in the home. Uh, but I think that's the responsibility of, of the federal government, the, the state and local governments to really make sure people understand where the lead could come from. Because um, we always talk about the pipes. We never talk about what could happen in the house. And I know it's it's maybe silly and, 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 and probably not the most important thing to talk about, but knowing a lot of the older homes in Malvern probably still have a lot of these old faucets and old piping inside our, our wall. So I think that that's something we need to talk about uh, going forward as well. Great, thank you. I've got Moreo and then uh, Karen, and then after Karen, then Eric and Yuting, um, I'm going to come to you to see if you've got any reflections on what you're hearing. So I've got Moreo, Karen, and then I'm going to come to you, Moreo. Good job. Um, two quick things. Uh, in terms of the inventory, one thing that I've run into, uh, not specifically in Malden, but in other communities where I've done direct community outreach, is a challenge with identifying private side uh, material in the case of renters. Uh, there are multiple cases where renters don't have access to their own basements and therefore can't give permission to the city. Um, I think that it would be important for EPA, one, to communicate um, whether or not cities automatically have the right to enter private property to check a lead service line, as well as best practices in terms of how to communicate to landlords, especially the importance of cooperation on this issue. Um, that's obviously uh, a whole set of communication that right now cities often have to develop on their own. And so I think that um, EPA providing more guidance in terms of language and communication would be really important to guaranteeing that renters aren't left behind when it comes to identifying their private side material. And then in that same vein, a lot of customers, uh, a lot of homeowners receive information about their lead and drinking water through their water bills, which is not always the case for renters who often don't pay their own water bills. So providing more direct instruction and communication um, from EPA to water systems in terms of how to effectively reach um, folks who aren't, aren't receiving information through water bills would be really key. Great, Mario, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna to come to Karen. Um, uh, and then after that, I'm going to come to you, Yuting and Eric. And then um, I'm going to be asking folks um, after uh, Yuting and Eric go to be uh, putting things into the chat as uh, folks are already doing on other things that they want uh, to talk about, identifying lead in drinking water. And then we're going to pivot to the next uh, discussion topic, which is addressing lead in drinking water. So Karen, please. Um, I had a Hi. quick question. Um, <clears throat> Craig, I was thinking on the same term anyways, about lead in the house with soldering or whatever pipes, different areas that might be that are not with the pipe coming in the house. Is there any, you know, how we have the carbon monoxide alarms and stuff, is there any, have they developed anything where a person could check their own house? Because I can't imagine the city going to every single house. <laughs> That's all. Does, does anyone on the, on, and thank you, Karen. Um, uh, does anyone online have a answer uh, to Karen's question? And then um, uh, Karen Hayes, I'll come to you next. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so uh, Karen uh, Lynch, what I'll do is I will put um, I will put the question in the chat, um, and then if anyone has an answer to the question, um, please uh, put it back in the chat. So I'm going to go to uh, Karen Hayes, and then Eric and you Ting will come to you. Thank you. I'll just make this quick. I was going to respond to John DeSantis, and um, <clears throat> because I I feel for what he was talking about, and then when I heard uh, Moreo and um, actually Craig speak, it all kind of intertwined. So for John, I can imagine what that must feel like um, if you're going up to a home, especially if it's a renter's home or somebody that's not aware and hearing that, that news um, about having led or tested and they might not know, I'm sure a lot of people don't know that they are responsible if they're an owner, but they're responsible for the pipes that come to your house. Um, and I picture myself and what that, that would sound like and I, and I know how to get resources. So um, I just wanted to point out that that just leads to more communication and, and meetings and really trying to get the word out to people about um, what the process is and who you can call. 
um, which is something like, so when Craig was talking about his own family um, um, situation that, you know, he also knows, like I know how to navigate, right? So we really have to um, get out information on what, you know, what it means, who to contact and what you can do um, if you do hear that you have lead in your pipes. Um, and and maybe loans possibly because renters, um, again, probably aren't getting any of this information because they're not getting the water bill. So um, it's all really about community, you know, getting the word out to the community in languages that they can hear and also just go to the places that they are. I'm just, that's my super concern <clears throat> about hearing about the inequities of how this affects our population. Thank you, Karen Hayes. Um, Dee, I'm gonna to come to you now and then um, Eric and you too. So Dee, please. Um, um, you are st you're still on mute. Um, so no, it happens to the best of us, Dee, I'll tell you, it happens to me eight times a day. Um, I, still, I still can't hear you. There you go, that looks okay. good. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to touch on the issue of community health education. I would like mm -hmm. to point out, and, and I don't know if uh, there is any representation today from the uh, Melrose Wakefield Healthcare Community Benefit Office and the uh, Cambridge Health Alliance as well, because these are existing community health, um, community benefit programs. And I would strongly urge that we work with these uh, and they are um, accountable through the Massachusetts law to the attorney general's office. So this is an existing structure and we need to um, involve and work together uh, with something that's already um, you know, for, for the health of our communities. And so I don't know if uh, that could be followed through, but thank you so much. Okay. Um, thank you, Dee, very much. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, now turn uh, Tarek and uh, Yuting. I'm going to ask you to share um, a little bit about what you've been hearing. And then after that, um, I'm going to be pivoting um, to the next uh, topic, which is addressing lead in drinking water. So if folks have any other thoughts about identifying lead in drinking water, um, to please put it um, into the chat. So Yuting. Thank you, Rob. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, first, I just want to thank both uh, Mareo and also Stephen for your presentation. Um, really, this is my first um, LCR uh, roundtable um, listening session and engagement. So I am very impressed with the amount of information that's in both presentation. I really appreciated um, Mareo's uh, presentation to talk about um, the different challenges and what is missing and also what kind of action that EPA should consider. Um, similarly with Stephen, with your information is very helpful to know. Um, from all the uh, um, feedback from the community, I, I really appreciate um, hearing on the ground uh, why communication is so important and the different segment of population that we need to consider both the renter uh, community as well as folks who own and how do we make sure that the importance of uh, lead reduction is out there and that we need to um, sort of think about the importance of communicating, making sure people are aware that um, lead reduction is very important and then making sure that folks are on board when it comes to uh, less surface line inventory as well as replacement uh, for both the homeowner and people who rent um, and also for uh, childcare facilities who may be um, not aware of some of these programs to get involved. So I really appreciate all of the on the ground um, information that we're hearing uh, today. Uh, I'll add to that. Um, I wanna thank everybody for their input on these issues and um, uh, highlight a couple more themes, but picking up on the importance of communication um, as Yu Ting just discussed, um, and, and as John highlighted, when he when he shows up at the door for, uh, of the of the customers, it's important that the there's a shared understanding of the importance of the actions that he needs to engage with the with the customers 
uh, so they understand and are motivated to take the actions they need to protect their public health. And so, um, and then I think also um, as, um, as uh, Marsha talked about in terms of the notification, uh, her support for the notification requirements, but there's that important part of then what? Uh, so the communication is really critical to people understanding uh, what are the steps that they can take? And, and then that, that bridges into the other theme and important point that I heard in the conversation today, which is resources, finances, um, are really critical to uh, communities and individuals being able to take the actions that are needed to reduce their exposure to lead and drinking water. Um, and um, that, that gets into the issues of the private and the public side of the lead service lines. And uh, another theme that we heard about um, in this conversation is the concerns about these a partial lead service line replacements in which the public portion of the line is replaced uh, in some situations and, and the remaining uh, private side is the, I assume that that's the scenario that people are most concerned about. That's the most common scenario that we've encountered. Um, the, the, those households served by those privately um, where the line is still private uh, remain at risk and uh, maybe even at increased risk because of the disturbance from the partial uh, um, uh, replacement. Um, Inventories, uh, lots of challenges and engagement on uh, inventories. Um, uh, Mareo and uh, others uh, talked about uh, the renters, uh, the issues of access and the ability to engage the homeowners in developing the inventory. I think that's an important topic um, and a, an important aspect of this. I was pleased to learn from Steve's presentation about the fact that uh, the city of Malden does have uh, some mapping up there and has taken steps to try and uh, understand that. I think that's a, a great thing to learn. Uh, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to talk to Baldwin is to get the perspective of not the largest systems and what they've been able to do so far. And, I, and, and one of the issues and concerns that we have is can smaller water systems, do they have the resources to be able to understand that? And so Malden's perspective and what they've done so far is really important. Um, the, the next really important theme that I heard was um, partnerships. Um, the, the need, uh, this, is the, the need, this is not an action that the water system alone can take and the need to engage communities, all aspects of the community, uh, the public health community. Um, uh, both Guy and, and, and Karen talked about sort of the, the social determinants and the, um, the factors that impact where the greatest public health is gonna be impacting that. That's leveraging the resources of the public health community locally um, to understand um, uh, where the community's uh, challenges are, are there as well. Um, and um, Craig talked about his experience with his, uh, his home and, um, and his sons with the elevated lead levels and, and the issue of not, not having it isolated just on the lead service line, but there are other uh, con contributors, uh, drinking water, non-drinking water. Um, Karen asked a question about that, which I might be able to sort of give some light on, uh, Karen, about the faucets. Um, the, the question about a, a, a test, um, I'm not, aside from a, a sampling of drinking water that comes out of the faucet, I'm not aware of a test where you can test the faucet, but there are other indicators in terms of the dates of the, the faucet. A couple of key dates to remember are 2014. That was when um, a new lead-free requirement was issued. After any, any device that was sold after installed after 2014 has to be no less than 0.2 percent lead uh, in drinking water. And then another date, 1986, was, the, uh, was another date in which Congress first limited the amount of lead. So if you have a sense of the age of the device, that's, a, that's another proxy that could be used. Um, but no test aside from testing the water itself uh, that I can think of on that regard. Sorry that I wasn't able to get myself off mute to answer your question earlier. Um, so I, I think I want to... Um, uh, leave it there, but I really appreciate, again, the perspectives we've heard, and I know we've got lots more to talk about, so I'll turn it back to Rob. Great. Um, Yuting, Eric, great, thank you. Um, and so, um, as Eric just teed me up before, we're going to go ahead and pivot and now uh, spend uh, the next 20 or so minutes um, talking about addressing lead in drinking water. So if you have any final thoughts on identifying lead in drinking water, um, the sampling, and the inventory. Um, please put those things in the chat. I really appreciate the way uh, folks are using the chat to amplify um, others' thoughts and uh, to put primary thoughts in there. Um, so now I want to uh, pivot to addressing lead in drinking water. Again, if you want to just uh, write down some of the most important things you want to make sure um, EPA hears during this session so that if we don't get to it, um, you're able to drop it into the chat at the end of the session. 
Um, when I talked to Mareo, um, he thought that perhaps um, I could go to uh, some folks at the city of Malden, um, either engineering or John um, with the water department uh, to maybe kick off with some additional adi uh, initial thoughts here on addressing lead in drinking water. So Yem or uh, John, I don't know if uh, uh, you have any thoughts to kick us off and then I'm gonna be asking folks to raise their hand by pressing Alt-Y. Um, so, uh, Yem or John? Yem? Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay. Uh, could you repeat that again? Yeah, so um, I just wanted to make space for you if there was um, any thoughts that you wanted to share about lead service line replacement, about uh, financing lead service line replacement, um, find and fix from the perspective of the city. The yep. Department of Engineering. Yeah, so um, uh, this is Yem again. Uh, thank you for having me at Yem, the uh, city engineer here. Uh, since I've got here, the mayor approved a five year plan for the uh, capital replacement, uh, uh, replacement of a uh, water main in the city. And we have uh, about 2.5 miles of uh, old pipe you know, under that five year program. And that's a Again, that's an $8 million just to do the water main replacement and uh, another $8 million to complete the road restoration. Again, these are expensive projects. And looking at a glance, uh, from looking at a backlog at a glance, and there's another six miles of water main that we could replace, easily replace now. Uh, and that's, a, again, that's six miles. Uh, if you look at our current program, that's another 10 years to get done, to get those six miles done. So uh, I do want to, you know, uh, say a little bit of help that the uh, MWRA has a loan program that provides low interest loan to the city, which is great, you know, again, but um, again, it's 0% interest loan, but it's still a loan that we have to, you know, the city has to come up with uh, capital to uh, uh, fund these projects. And I just want to put it out there that uh, any additional, you know, money that can come down from the state or the federal to address the, the water main replacement would be huge. And again, um, you know, road restoration is another component that, that we have to deal with. Uh, it, I, you know, I think most of us know that the chapter 90 program uh, addressed it, you know, try to address road condition. But again, what we get from chapter 90, you know, that's a equate to a 50 year cycle, you know, to, to replace the street. So anytime we wreck the road right, by uh, <clears throat> replacing water mains, uh, we need to address the road. So I, I think if there's money to include uh, not just the water main component, but the road component as, as well. Uh, now, looking at the lead service line replacement alone, um, under that five-year plan, uh, we would replace about 306 of, lead, of lines, of service lines, which more than 50% of those are lead. So again, and as we're replacing these water mains, we're also replacing the lead lines. Uh, which is good. And we have a separate uh, lead line replacement program that, uh, you know, it's a combination of co contractor, combination of uh, Johnny's crew, and a uh, combination of uh, the lead ordinance that uh, Council Spatterforge uh, touched on, which uh, in the last two years, we have uh, we got about 120 of the lead, uh, lead lines replaced through the ordinance uh, requirement so which that that's huge and uh, in the past four years we replaced a total of uh, you know more than a thousand line uh, lead line in the city between the private and the public uh, which you know 300 of those are done by the DPW and uh, 600 of those are done through contractors that we hired um, you know again uh, that's you know that's a four-year program which we able to replace more than a thousand lead lines um, any, I uh, just want to put out that any additional help for the lead line replacement would be huge for the city, especially for the city model. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Steve, before I come to you, uh, John, I want to see if uh, um, you had anything else to add from the uh, city perspective. And then if not, then I'll come to you, Steve. Steve Estes. Uh, yeah, um, basically from my perspective, when we get to that last category of find and fix, I think through the, uh, the guise of inv inventory upgrade and management, that find and fix uh, levels that we hit that Yim spoke about, 
uh, both in-house and through contractual assistance. Um, it, it just be, it's becoming a, a better managed tool, uh, tool through our GIS layers, where someone can go on the website and actually track, um, you know, what is it, what what in the last time their service line was taken care of, upgraded, what it's made out of. So that living, breathing layer really does help that find and fix measure as we go forward to show the results that then I can show to someone when I show up their door. And because I always take that attitude of not being an adversary, but someone who's gonna be there to try to get them where they need to be so that they can feel safe and secure about the water that, that's coming into their taps. Um, bet between all those different aspects, with, with all the ordinances and everything else that goes on, I think more needs to be focused on that, more resources into that, so that a guy like me, when, when I show up and, and say, well, you know, I want you to be able to look at it, okay, I just made these, these I just put a new bathroom in, maybe a front deck or, or whatever, over $30,000 worth of upgrades. When is it gonna be on my GS layer in case I ever wanna sell my property or do it again? People are in tune with it. And I believe if we had a little bit more resources aimed towards that for them to be able to see it, track it, and know it at the end of the day, like Marcia was saying, what's going to happen next? Well, that helps that find and fix measure and what we're doing up there. Great. Um, thank you, John. I've got uh, uh, Steve Estes, and then I'm going to come to uh, Councillor Spadafora and then Councillor Winslow. Uh, so, Steve? Thank you. Um, just a couple things on... Uh, the, the conundrum of partial lead service line replacements. Uh, this is a real sticky issue uh, from a regulatory perspective that uh, um, I hope EPA looks closely at. We would absolutely always prefer to fully remove a lead service line. And one of the ways in which we can get that to happen is for the communities to have uh, the funding available to make the private side uh, done at as low a cost or no cost to the homeowner. Um, that's clear. Uh, the flip side of that that we have to struggle with is if the city is replacing a main um, and digging up the street and disturbing all of those service lines, or if they're putting a sewer line in disturbing um, all those service lines, it would be great if when they touch a lead service line, they replace it. Um, however, if the homeowner won't replace their portion, uh, should we disturb the portion in the public way and leave it there? Um, sometimes when we're doing a sewer project, we actually would have to cut it. Uh, should we patch it, but leave the lead in the ground? I don't, I don't have a good answer there. Um, and so I hope that EPA, as they're thinking about this, provides the flexibility for good in the street, boots on the ground management of the water, sewer, and other infrastructure, um, while encouraging as much as possible that full lead service line replacement. And I just want to touch, touch back to the find and fix piece that just came up. Um, there's the, there's the customer service thing that we all do that those of us with uh, on the ground think of as finding and fixing problems for homeowners. That may not be exactly what's in the regulation. Um, I hope that as EPA is looking at the rule, they frame up as much as possible the requirements in that section of find and fix as customer service oriented. What we wanna be able to do is if a homeowner has an elevated lead level or has a question to be able to go in um, and without regulatory complications, help them figure out how to reduce their exposure um, and not create um, a, a giant paperwork trail and opportunities for failure to notify in a certain number of days the state and all that. Streamline these things to make them workable. Um, the alternative uh, to some extent, maybe not from Alden, which is a very customer service oriented community, but for some communities would be, if it's too complicated, we're just not doing it. Um, so let's you know, think about that. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, next in line is uh, Councillor Spedafora and then uh, Councillor Winslow and then uh, Karen Hayes and then Moreo. Councillor Spedafora. Thanks again. I just wanted to, uh, you know, go back to a couple of things on, on uh, the ordinance that was passed by the council. So first of all, I, I can't take all the credit. Uh, it was really an idea that we copied off of Title V uh, that went a home uh, with, with that has um, um, a leaching field. Uh, they have to upgrade that uh, upon. Uh, I think I don't know. Forget the, the time. I think it's every so many years, or at least when they sold it. So that's how the premonition came for us uh, in a meeting. 
Uh, and it was it was because I think what everybody's talking about, we were not seeing uh, full lead line service replacements coming fast enough to the city of Malden. Uh, and because we have ho all the housing stock, uh, what Mr. DeSanta said, we didn't have good tracking mechanisms. Uh, and I think we did it at a good time because as the economy has heated up in the city of Malden over the last five or six years, we've seen a lot of home ownership where it's changing. We do have more immigrants coming up. So the housing stock is still old. Values of the homes have come up, but they've turned over. So we've had a lot of sales. So I, uh, as Yum said, we've, we've had probably 100, 120 houses that we would have never had the opportunity to go in there and bite the apple. Uh, we all we, we try to MRA, which is the Malden uh, Housing Authority, to use 100% um, uh, loan, 0% interest, excuse me, 0% interest loan for some of the homeowners who, didn't, who couldn't qualify to fix those those loans. So I think everybody said the same thing here. The more federal resources we get, I know uh, uh, Congressman Clark has uh, earmarked $4 million. It can't, it can't, we can't get it quick enough. Uh, but I, I think the other thing is, too, for the city of Malden is uh, to, to really focus on um, getting to some of those, those houses uh, even in a more timely fashion, maybe not only low income, but with children. Uh, and, and making it almost a mandate, uh, whether we help pay for that or not, but making it a mandate like like fire safety. When you when they you know we, we require housing uh, inspections for our sprinklers, we should be requiring the same thing for water pipes. Um, uh, I think you know it's it's probably more important to have safe drinking water than than having a, a smoke detector in your house working on it. So, for me, any any way we can we can strengthen those laws to require the homeowners to to, to make those 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 changes quicker. Understanding that some do not have the, the resources, but I, I think there's an opportunity right now for us to help them with those resources uh, is imperative for the city of Mall to move forward. Um, and, and I'm just, you know, like I said, I'm happy that we got those 120, but there's a lot, lot more work we need to do going forward to get the remaining housing stock to come in there. Uh, and the other thing I would finally say is that $30,000 threshold um, is probably going to be easy. I know it's not 100% implemented now, but with uh, two by four being $8. Uh, I mean that thirty that thirty thousand dollar number might be something as simple as putting on a back deck, unfortunately, or doing a roof over, or putting windows in your home. So I, I think the faster we can kind of get our hands around that using technology, uh, whether it be doing mailings or having you know more staffing in the water department to go out and talk to the homeowners about this, I think it's imperative. And I understand language barriers and all that, but but, but we have to do a better outreach and really uh, drive that home. Uh, just like we've done a great job, with, like I said, fire prevention um, and things like that, we we, we have to get uh, going on on the uh, partial, the full re full lead line service. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Winslow, uh, then Karen Hayes, and then Moreo. Councillor Winslow. Yeah, I I think uh, I want to first say Councillor Spadafore is a little humble in the uh, in the thing. We we are innovative in terms of having the requirement that. Uh, you know, when a home is sold, that lead lines be replaced. And I think uh, it, it is an innovation that uh, maybe we adapted something from our septic system state regs, but uh, it's something unique. And I uh, give Councilor Spedafor a um, credit for that. Uh, I mean, uh, just another perspective. Uh, getting back to this, looking from the lens of reducing risk. I I, I put a link um, on the chat about. Uh, the assessment I did with a uh, MIT uh, uh, person that we were looking at re reduction in years of exposure. And I think one of the things that my perspective is that, um, you know, we have a program now focused mostly on homeowners. We, one of the other challenges is what, as our, our engineer talks about our water main replacements the focus of our water main replacements is on providing fire safety. And so that tends to also be in the homeowning sections of our city. So our strategies are prioritizing resources to our homeowners. Um, and the 60% of people who rent um, are not. And the other reality is we also have a lot more kids in those rental properties as, um, as we have. So one of the things I would say is that as looking at uh, this particular grant resources, you heard how expensive it is. I mean, I'm just amazed. It's $6 million a mile to replace a main and the lead services and fix the road. Um, we have 108 miles of road. So that's a lot of money. So I think that for whatever we do, um, we, we want to get more. Um, and those resources really need to pri be prioritized towards the communities that were renters and there's a real equity thing. I hate 
when I see in our community where resources intended to go to low and moderate um, neighborhoods get siphoned off. And so I really think that in any grant program, I think communities should be asked about the, you know, to do kind of the assessment we've done is identify the communities where there's the most kids at risk. And you got to put your, the money we give you in those communities as a priority. Um, I think we will do that. We're going to get some ARPA money. We're going to put some more money. Uh, we're de dedicating at least $8 million of our ARPA money to water and sewer service. And I think certainly lead pipes is a key thing. But you know, again, saying that it's uh, let's make sure as we take uh, the money and put more money in it, it's going to uh, the communities that need it the most and that aren't being served right now. Um, you, you know, even though we're making great progress um, and doing what we can as a scrappy community that doesn't have a lot of resources, when the federal resources come, they should go into the parts of a community that need the most. Um, so that's that's just m m my major comment there. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, that's just my major comment that, you know, at the rate of 150 a year, you know, it'll be 2037 before we address all our service lines. So um, it would be good to speed that up. We've been pushing it. We're making a little bit of progress, but um, I just think if we get more federal resources, we've got to make sure that that is money well spent. Thanks. Great. Um, thank you. Um, okay. I've got uh, Karen Hayes um, and then Moreo and then um, Eric and you will come to see if you've got any additional and uh, reflections and maybe make it pretty quick this time. Um, and then we're going to move to um, uh, communications and public outreach. So Karen, please. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, say a, so a comment on what Yem um, about the five-year plan. Um, I think if someone could drop, and they might have already done this in the chat, I would love to see, I'm sure that's up on the city website somewhere, but is it also like, can we see the plan in progress of how many, um, where we are in that plan? Um, that would be great. Um, and the other was the um, I dropped this in the chat as well. I think I, I had seen that the American Rescue Plan um, might be able to cover for lead pipe. So uh, just to be sure and check that out, that would be a great resource to use. Millions of dollars or <laughs> uh, billions of dollars are coming down the road. So um, that would be great. Um, also that I'm, I'm concerned and want to be, just want to put this out there that I'm concerned about um, it's great to be testing people and going in there and making sure that we're testing people's homes. But my concern then is what happens after someone gets tested, it's a lead, you know, they find lead and their renters, especially, or someone that can't afford it. Are we, you know, are they going to have to like move if they can't afford to replace the lead pipes there? Like what are the options there? So um, it's great to provide that testing, but before we do that, make sure there's a plan um, for what happens if it's tested positive and there's no resources, you know, to help them replace them, what happens then? Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Moreo, and then uh, I'm gonna come to you, Ting and Eric, and then uh, we'll switch to the public outreach aspect here. Moreo? So I just wanna really um, draw out and highlight uh, things that uh, Steve Craig and Stephen Winslow um, all said when, I really applaud and think it is the smart move when you're already investing a lot of money into main replacement, which is expensive and does involve um, those road repairs. It is smart and it is correct to replace lead service lines at the same time. As an advocate, I see it as a gigantic loss when um, the private side can't be replaced at the same time. I understand that there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen between the homeowner and the city and that resources are a real concern. In, an, in a perfect world, if I woke up tomorrow, what would happen is the city would have the authority and the money whenever they're opening up the road, regardless of the situation, to replace the public and private side, whether it's a lack of ability to pay on the side of the private owner, or frankly, a lack of will and interest, just because the most cost-effective moment for the city will be when that road is already being opened up and they can tack on the cost of private side replacement at the same time. Obviously that requires additional resources, um, but I would really encourage EPA to provide some language and some prompting 
um, with case studies, letting them know that when you're already opening up the road, doing other capital improvement projects, that is likely your most cost-effective time to replace the private ser led service line. And it might be a moment where you want to explore some flexibility in terms of requiring the private um, the property owner pay, pay the private side. Um, in addition to it being the safest in terms of not exposing people to increased lead levels, it's also just the most pragmatic cost-effective solution. Um, so I would really encourage EPA to explore that and provide some prompting and language um, for cities when they're in that situation. And then this moves beyond the lead and copper rule, but I do want to highlight there are cities that have passed local ordinances that give them the authority to go onto private property and replace the lead service line. I think Newark is a great example of that. And, um, you know, this is really for everyone on the call if there's interest and ability in doing that, that's a way to expedite this and move this um, closer to equity and speed up the timeline period. So obviously that's a little bit out of the lead and copper rule, but it's worth um, communities exploring that option because again, it is, as an advocate, I see it as such a gigantic loss when a road is opened up, the public side is replaced and the private side is left in the ground either because of lack of ability to pay on the part of the property owner or just a lack of willingness and education that leads to a partial lead stain in the ground that we'll have to get dug up at a later point. Great, uh, thank you, Mareo. Um, um, Marsha or Marcia, um, I think I'm gonna come to you and then um, Eric and Yuting, I'll come to you next. Thank you. Um, I'm going to suggest that um, uh, for households that have children <clears throat> or renters, um, who have children in the household until this matter is resolved um, through replacement of the lead pipes, uh, full replacement, then I would suggest that there's some responsibility by city government, by state government, by federal government to provide uh, bottled water to those households until to protect the children to protect uh, until this matter is resolved. If we're talking eight years, 10 years before the pipes can replace, you know, um, like Steve talked about reducing risk and uh, the number of years of exposure, I don't think uh, we can just let that uh, go unattended. And so that's my suggestion. Great, thank you. Um, Eric Uting, I want to provide maybe a minute here to um, uh, further reflect on what you're hearing, and then I'm going to pivot to communications and uh, public outreach. Um, and as, as uh, Eric and Uting are sharing their perspectives, if folks have other thoughts um, that they want to uh, put into the chat about addressing lead and drinking water, um, I would encourage you to do that now. Uting or Eric? Eric, I see you're off of mute. Thank you, Rob. Um, thank you everyone for the presentation, Yem, and also for everyone who has spoken up about um, your perspective on this theme, which is addressing lead and drinking water. Um, a lot of great ideas from, uh, from the find and fix the GIS layer tracking to help conveying the need um, to uh, Steven's remark about needing some flexibility um, and guidance kind of on the ground sort of messaging. Um, really, just really appreciate the ordinance, um, kind of this best practice that we can really just get the good information out there for other cities to be able to utilize and copy um, to advance less service line replacement. Um, sounds like it has been a great success. Um, just also, I, I saw that in the chat box that Erga talked about um, being you know, cognizant of the language differences and barrier when communicating with communities and also the key role that the community advocates play. Um, really appreciate everybody's thoughtful input on this theme. Eric? Uh, really briefly, uh, we, a lot of the same themes we heard in the first session, but uh, a couple of progressive and uh, innovative ideas that the city has done. Um, uh, congratulations on um, the, the ordinance uh, that uh, requires replacement of lead service lines uh, on uh, seals and um, uh, major improvements to the households. That's a really innovative way to get things done, as well as uh, consolidating replacements with in infrastructure problem projects. As uh, Mareo indicated, um, there's some cost savings that can be achieved 
uh, when you're opening up the street once as opposed to twice, uh, uh, you, can, you can achieve some cost savings, but uh, the engagement and the, the, the funding for the customers is critical. But I'll, I'll leave it there. A lot of great other points and congratulations on the, the steps the city has taken so far. Great. Um, so we, I'd like to immediately pivot into the third discussion topic, which is communications and public outreach. Um, and so I know, Mareo, you were, uh, um, we had identified you to kick off our conversation. So Mareo, I'd like to immediately turn it over to you and then ask that folks uh, raise their hand as we've done in the other uh, blocks uh, and uh, we get the conversation going. So Mareo, please. Yeah, I'm going to make it super quick because I want um, community members to have as much time to share as possible because ultimately that's a, that's how you know community outreach is working or not. Um, my experience with community outreach is more, more, always more when you think you've done enough, double it um, and make sure that it's accessible um, and answering a number of barriers. So that includes language, making sure that things are being translated into all of the languages that are that our community members speak. Um, and it also means being aware that not all communication channels are going to work for all people. If you're a renter, you're likely not getting your water bill. If you are low income, you might not have reliable access to internet, much less um, be receiving the public health and education messages that tell you where to look for information on the internet. So again, partnering with local community groups that actually do have those channels of communication established and that trust established is absolutely key. And what I would love to hear from community residents is how has outreach worked for you so far? And I'd really encourage EPA to listen to the places where it's fallen short and think about how that, um, how those instances could be translated into best practices communicated to water utilities when it comes to communication, paying extra attention again to those inequities and communication barriers. Great. Thank you, Mareo. So um, uh, I put the question that Mareo uh, put out to the community into the chat. How has outreach worked for you so far and where has it succeeded and where has it fallen short? And so um, please raise your hand to jump into the conversation. Yeah, Erga, please. Oops, I'm, there you go. Meeting, meeting Moreo is how we um, learned about this. And then we were able to host a fourth Wednesday community conversation and have him do a presentation. Um, I think getting the word out is so important and really giving the community an opportunity to learn and understand the sense of urgency and the impact, because like I said earlier, you don't know what you don't know. And whatever process the city has been using, it's not really hitting home because they may be sending information to the house, but folks don't take the time out to see it because it's just one more thing. Um, but there needs to be maybe a different way of, of um, sending out brochures with the information that they need. But again, a sense of urgency and um, just being straightforward in terms of what the dangers are and what they look like and what the plan is um, to support whatever it is that that um, is going on. Because I think, again, when you don't get it, you just don't get it. And lives are at risk, especially the BIPOC communities um, throughout Malden. And this is very, very important and dear to my heart. Um, and just really concerned about the young kids and also the elderly population. So again, a need of um, the language and the sense of urgency for this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Karen Hayes. <clears throat> uh, yes, so as far as um, what's been used in the past to get our word out to the public, um, I think it's going to take a tremendous amount of effort at first um, and seem, you know, overwhelming, but we have to lay the groundwork, uh, you know, of trust. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, you have to go into the communities and build up a relationship or build up a relationship at least with the um, leaders of those communities uh, before they start knowing or or listening and preparing themselves to what the city is putting out there. Uh, some people don't even know that there's a 
Facebook page. The city does a great job of putting out everything on there, but we have to, um, I, I can speak from the Hispanic and Latino um, uh, populations, a distrust sometimes, right, of government, um, who, who they're going to listen to. So I think it's going to take time to build that up before, um, but once we get the groundwork and set a template and build that trust, then blasting it out will probably work. Um, or sending like newsletters, showing up, uh, flyers. I know that Malden Core and a lot of the groups that I'm in, we still go to old school posting flyers around um, around the area where people walk in different languages and it works. Um, a lot of times you're just gonna catch people walking by. So I think kind of doing, going back to old school ways of getting the word out before you move forward and then letting people know where to look for future um, announcements. Um, will do us a lot of justice and cut down on the work prior, but putting it in initially is gonna be huge, but necessary. Great, thank you. Other thoughts, uh, please raise your hand or I don't have anyone in the queue. So um, if someone has a thought, just feel free to jump right into the conversation. I just yeah, love um, the idea. Oh. Yeah, please Karen, Karen uh, Lynch. It might be getting late um, in the season, but you know, I imagine sending home notices with students helps get the word out to families and homes, especially to renters, I guess. So. Great. Thank you. I love Marsha's idea with the bottled water because my mom, um, we live where, you know, we do have lead. <laughs> in our pipes and her whole thing is I, I buy bottled water and it's between that and her medication. And so at minimum, this is something that's really, really important. Um, and I do agree with you, Karen, it's never too late um, in getting the schools involved. Um, but at the same time, I think we definitely need a multifaceted approach. So the more you hear about it all over the place, it's gonna sink in. Thank you. We're good, thank you. Um, so one thing that I just want to highlight is that the most successful outreach that I've ever done has always been in partnership with community organizations. Um, and there are a lot of ways to get creative and sometimes old school really is the best way. If you want to guarantee that someone hears something, be in front of them so you know that they're hearing you. Um, we did really, I think, innovative work in Chelsea where we partnered with the local EJ group Chelsea Greenroots and actually went door to door in Spanish and English told people about lead in drinking water, how to reduce exposure, and then get in contact with the city. Um, organization, you know, organizations like mine were more than happy to partner and do that work. Um, and I think the more that EPA encourages that as a tool set that really every community has, every community has dedicated residents who care and want to help solve this issue um, would be great. And then of course, anything that cities and on the state level um, funding that can be created to encourage and provide compensation for those partnerships is, in my opinion, one of the most effective ways to guarantee um, successful community outreach. Great. Um, Dee, go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to uh, jump off the, uh, the old fashioned uh, methods of communication. One is, uh, you know, the water bills. Um, and so I was involved in um, kind of another project and we use the water bills to, and that would get to the homeowners, but um, to increase awareness and, and really some key education and resources. And then also um, as a member of the uh, Senior Action Council, I would say uh, we really, really need to address this digital divide because if there's a way we really can get greater access to seniors, especially in the um, MHA, you know, residents, that, um, you know, we, we really could use um, uh, Yuma, uh, the, what was MATV, I mean, just get PSAs out on these uh, programs and, but more even flyers just to our residents of our several uh, buildings. So I think we really need to, to really concentrate on some of the, um, I'll say old fashioned ways. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dean. 
Okay, we have time for probably two or three more comments. Um, and so I'm um, hopeful that we get other folks to raise their hand here. So Mareo, as the uh, uh, organizer, is there any perspective that you want me, anyone um, that you want to uh, encourage to speak out on this? Because uh, you know that uh, they may have a story to tell. Yeah, Susie, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know that when we talked, you had a really um, excellent example sort of of how this has played out for you in real life, um, both in terms of the notification and also sort of the sticker shock when it comes to the cost of private replacement. Oh, sure, sure. So um, when, when we received our flyer um, about the, you know, lead lines being replaced in our neighborhood, um, they did let us know all the information and just being in a situation where we had other, other projects going on and low funding, um, we weren't able to um, do it at the same time. Um, I can't remember if there was an option, and, you know, letting us know, um, you know, about contacting um, organizations um, to help with funding, but, but definitely that was a key thing. And I also don't remember anybody coming to our home, letting us know, um, you know, necessarily the importance. So um, all of the information that I learned more recently was through Moreo and Clean Water Action and Clean Water Fund. Um, and I was thinking that uh, if there was a way to have um, Moreo's um, program uh, either brought ward by ward or, you know, if the city could um, present it um, you know, in a, in a Zoom format, that that would be a really great way. And another thought I had was, if it's possible um, through like um, community services or something like that, or a community service program because of lack of funding to have um, students or volunteers be the ones like going house to house, dropping off, like say um, information kits and in multiple languages and also water testing instead of someone having to um, take time off from work and go down to city hall, you know, have it maybe brought to their home. So to make it easier, um, something like that. Susie, thank you. Any, um, uh, anyone else you want to uh, invite to speak on this topic? No, I've got a couple of last thoughts, but I want to pause for a second and make sure that everyone who wants to say something has. Yeah, um, Marsha Marcia, please. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I just, <clears throat> sorry, want to say that I think this is a fantastic opportunity for meaningful collaboration between those impacted communities and local government to let us find solutions um, to what I consider an environmental injustice issue of lead in the water. Um, and so let's find ways to collaborate on this and make sure that communities are at those decision-making tables. This round table is wonderful. Let's make sure this continues so that voices of the communities, particularly impacted by this, continue to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Any final thoughts before uh, Maria, I'll turn it over uh, to you for your um, final thoughts there and then um, to Eric and you, Ting. Anyone else from the community have anything else they wish to share? Okay, if folks have any other thoughts that they wanna put into the chat about this topic, um, uh, we got about five minutes, so please uh, take the time to do that. Um, so then Maria, I'd like to turn it over to you for um, some final thoughts and then uh, to Yuting and to Eric to close out the meeting. Maria, please. So um, one thing that I think is really important when we look at public outreach is understanding the, the barriers to making it work. Um, 
And as someone who community outreach and public education is really one of my primary job roles, it's a, it's a skill, it's a set of expertise, and it really is a full-time job. And so it shouldn't be surprising. And frankly, it shouldn't be, it can be a critique, but not a full critique of the city staff itself, because really the resources required to do a good job of this are often way beyond the scope of what um, water departments and municipal staff can do. And this is a really, in my opinion, easy, low-hanging fruit where EPA can make a huge difference in terms of providing really clear guidance on risk communication and community outreach. You know, in my perfect world, um, when a city did get an exceedance for lead and drinking water, part of any sort of consent decree would be a really clear set of templates and instructions in terms of this is how far in advance you probably need to start communicating with private site owners if you expect them, like Susie, to be able to um, actually have the time to look at their budget, respond, and come up with the resources and time to guarantee um, a coordinated private side replacement. This is um, the language and examples that are most convincing um, to private side residents. This is how you let someone know how serious this is without just freaking them out and overwhelming them. And these are all really specific skills um, that I and uh, tools that I think EPA could be providing more of so that cities can um, do that without it being as much of a big lift because really communication is key. You can have the best program in the world and all of the resources. And if nobody is there to listen to it and take advantage of it, you're kind of where you started. And so just really emphasizing any help that EPA can offer both in terms of best practices for communication as well as technical assistance um, and resources that cities can utilize to increase public partnerships and community outreach projects. Um, that'll just make the, these programs all the more successful and equitable. Great. Thank you, Moreo. And um, maybe before you put yourself on mute, um, maybe we could pivot to see if you've got any uh, final closing thoughts um, about the uh, roundtable as a whole. And then uh, Eric and Yu Ching, I'll come uh, to the two of you to close uh, out the meeting. So Moreo, any uh, final thoughts? Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think that whenever you get a group of people um, coming from so many different perspectives and life experiences together, you start to see how a rule on paper plays out in real life. And that's really what this is all about. It's matching policy and matching regulation to actual real life experiences on the ground. So to that end, I just really wanna say thank you to everyone who took this time. I hope that some of the recommendations and lived experiences of people uh, make it into the final rule. And um, really thank you EPA for recognizing the importance of community input when it comes to addressing lead and drinking water. Thank you. Yu Ting and Eric, uh, please close us off. Great. I, uh, I'll go ahead and, and speak for uh, Yu Ting and I here at closing out. I want to just first start with a reflection on the, the communication part and then move into a broader discussion of the, uh, the meeting as a whole. So um, Moreo had a couple of uh, really important points at the outset in terms of the importance of outreach and communication. I think his uh, summary of what needed to be done was do more and do more and do more. And then, and when you think you've even done more than enough, double that. Um, so the, I think that's, uh, um, that was a, a recurring theme I heard. And then um, other important points that were made were the issues of um, using multiple modes of communication. Um, um, uh, old school was a, was a phrase that was often uttered, how they were, they're not just the new modern technologies of, of communicating, but um, uh, flyers, face-to-face -face meetings, and the importance of, of, of that interaction is going to help get that uh, message. Karen talked about the upfront investment that needs to be made by communities to build the trust um, and, and understanding and appreciation. Um, and um, so I, I think all of that um, was really valuable and certainly uh, reiterated some themes that we've heard elsewhere. Moving into um, a summary overall of today's roundtable, I want to thank again Moreo and all of you for spending the time today putting together the materials, the presentations that you made, and giving us your thoughts about uh, the lead and copper rule. Um, a, a, another theme that Moreo presented at the beginning was that we're all united against the problem. Um, and while we get and understand that not everybody uh, necessarily agreed upon 
particular ways to address the problem, what was clear to, uh, to me and, and certainly is uh, a, of the highest priority to the administrator of EPA is reducing drinking water lead exposure and developing approaches that can effectively protect children and, and the entire population from the effects of drinking water lead exposure. The experience of Malden is really important for the agency to understand. Um, I think, um, Marcia, your words about um, this being a really great opportunity uh, for meaningful engagement on what you characterized as a significant environmental justice and equity issue was really a, a great summary of, of, of the importance of this. Um, I agree with you. I think uh, it is important that the agency continues to have these engagements and that we have these conversations with communities like Malden and, and communities across the country that have been struggling with this. And I just want to say thank you all for this really important feedback today. And um, we have um, been taking lots of notes and we're going to be sharing this with the, the others in the administration uh, and the agency as we um, uh, consider and, and determine how best to move forward to improving public health protection and, and reducing drinking water lead exposure. So thank you all. Great, thank you everybody. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.